When we think of the, uh, the historic polymath, um, it's synonymous with Renaissance man, or more appropriately, Renaissance person. Uh, we think of the age of humanism, uh, the Renaissance itself. We think of learned men who have uh, made significant discoveries or contributions or accomplishments in a variety of fields. Uh, names that come to mind, Leonardo da Vinci, and Michelangelo, Galileo. And we look at the education system at the time, which was uh, somewhat broad learning. The focus was on rhetoric and logic and grammar and math and music. But we look also over time how definitions can change and, and our, our perception of things can change. And so what Dr. Gar Garneau and I will do in the next few minutes is uh, we'll draw from various fields, uh, history and sociology and education and psychology, and, and give you some perspective and propose perhaps uh, redefining the polymath for contemporary society. And we'll begin with, with three questions. Um, First of all, can we de redefine the polymath? And if, if we can, how, how would it be? What is the polymath in contemporary society? And finally, where do we find this person or these principles of our redefined polymath? We'll begin by looking at historical and some sociological factors. OK, so if we're um, trying to locate the polymath, in search of a new definition. Uh, one of the things that we should look at, or one of the places that we should look, are the contextual or historical contexts in which the polymath easily fit into. Um, so what I want to do is just kind of roll back a little bit and find the essence of the polymath, which is more commonly found in rural communities prior to the Industrial Revolution. Okay, so one of the ways that we can understand the polymath is by looking at the larger societal context, and specifically I'm going to look at labor markets, but there are other possible places where we can look to find this definition. So if we start looking at rural life, especially before the Industrial Revolution, what we find is that we have high levels of homogeneity, meaning that people essentially had about the same life. Um, in a rural community, people would eat the same types of food, they would be into the same types of games and leisure activities. In general, they had the same job. Um, highly agrarian, most everyone farmed, most everyone farmed in the same communities. People generally had the, sh the same shared values, beliefs, and religions. So when we look at the impact of this, we see that this, in this leveled culture, having a breadth of skills, in other words, a large, wide range of skills, was highly conducive to survival in this type of, in, in this time period. So if we want to be able to extrapolate to the, that to the polymath, we see that people living at this time had a lot, a large range of skills. Even if it weren't for a lot of depth, it was still for a lot of breadth. So this breadth of knowledge in general for the populace can in some ways be extrapolated to the ideas of the polymath. So what we find happening with the Industrial Revolution is a change in this general orientation of individuals. So with the Industrial Revolution, we see large numbers of population moving from rural areas to urban areas. The consequence of this is people that used to have shared culture living next to each other are now living next to people who might be very different from one another, who are bringing different talents, um, who have a diversity and a different range of skill sets. And because the populations have increased at such large numbers in the Industrial Revolution, um, in the mid-1800s in Europe, and then anywhere from 50 to 80 years later, all the way to the United States, we find that a division of labor is probably a more efficient way for larger, more bureaucratic societies to operate. So one of the natural consequences of the Industrial Revolution and the movement of indiv individuals from rural to urban areas is the idea that there isn't an advantage from having this large breadth of knowledge anymore. The advantage to society is to specialize and diversify, to have individuals in some way working like a cog in a factory. And it was the way for people to survive at this time period, shortly after the Industrial Revolution. And so we see that division is far more practical. And in order for division of labor to, um, to prosper, we also had to have academic fields that um, reflected this. So I'm going to show just a couple of quick graphs real quick to um, kind of underscore the level and celerity at which um, we had societal change happening shortly after the Industrial Revolution. And this one's kind of mind-boggling. So for most of human history, we had about half a billion people on Earth. 
most of human history, we've had around 500 million people. So beginning around the time of the Industrial Revolution, 1800 is when we marked our first billion people. Um, our second billion, 130 years later. Our third billion was only 32 years after that. And since then, around every 10 to 15 years, we've been adding another billion people. As this trend has occurred, specialization has also been more of a necessity to deal with the highly bureaucratic nature of our society. Also wanted to show this really quickly. This is just the United States since 1900. In the past 100 years, the percentage of people living in, in urban areas has doubled from 40, continuously from 40 to about 80%. So we're living in a very different world that might not be conducive to what we consider to be polymath. And so um, as you move forward, uh, what I want to stress is that Industry calls for new jobs that are diverse, that are specialized. And because of this, the nature of academia had to change as well. And so what we see in academia, uh, paralleling what's going on in urbanization and specialization, is discipline-based education emerging in the mid to late 1800s, where educational institutions start to focus on compartmentalization and specialization and produce uh, learned and degreed people um, to meet the labor force and, and that's specialized in certain areas. And of course, today, we st our students still struggle with this. They must choose a major at some point, um, which is a source of frustration for many. Um, but that was the trend uh, starting in the late 1800s. Um, another interesting feature that, that comes out of uh, this this period is the vast fields of knowledge and research and these, these were emerging and blossoming. And so you would have uh, the field of science, for example, um, and this is just one rendering of, of a graphic, the way it can be broken down. But the field of science, the broad field, becomes broken down into these, these um, other fields. And then to extend that even further, to take one of these, for example, biology, uh, over a period of time, that starts to break into subfields. So the idea of mastering an entire field of science, for example, it just becomes ludicrous because of the body of knowledge uh, and then the splintering into these subfields. Um, so what, what might a contemporary polymath look like? Um, the Polymath Institute, and there actually is something called the Polymathic Institute, um, has a really interesting definition that, that we, can, we can learn a lot from, but I think we can extend. Um, it describes a polymath in, as a person of great or varied learning and suggests that a polymath, rather than mastering a subject and then searching for a new problem or question in that field, finds an interesting question and then acquires the knowledge and skills required to answer it without regard to subject boundaries. A couple of things to pull out. Um, it's interesting that it's a person of great or varied knowledge. Varied knowledge. Uh, a second interesting point, it asks, the polymath asks, asks questions. The idea of curiosity and discovery and inquiry is, is critical. Um, a third point, it, the polymath goes beyond subject boundaries. There's sort of a perception perhaps that there's just a vast field of knowledge not necessarily divided into subject, but a vast field of knowledge. And finally, another point to pull out of this, this person, the polymath, acquires skills. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, a little bit more here. Um, so the interesting points, it, it seems as though this is very accessible. And in our postmodern society, or post-post if we prefer, um, the idea of the individual or hyper-individuality is extremely important. And, you know, we have this perception of ac accessibility, that everything needs to be accessible to everyone. Uh, and so we've, we kind of bring it down to a level where these ideas seem to be accessible. Um, but notice, notice also that it's less depth-based and more breadth-based. Um, a fundamental skill set for this, and, and this is coming from a book by Alan Repko, uh, which is really about interdisciplinary research. And he's not really talking about the polymath here, but I think these are some skills that, 
that really come into play in maybe redefining the polymath. The idea of being enterprising, um, taking risks in making connections, love of learning, learning for the sake of learning, not for the tests, not just <laughs> studying for the tests. Where's our study guide? No. Um, reflection, just thinking about ideas, uh, tolerance for ambiguity, um, the, the idea that there are gray areas, and that's okay. There may be no true or false, or yes or no, or A, B, C, or D. Um, receptivity to pers perspectives of various disciplines and appreciation for diversity, information coming from other disciplines and other people. There's a respect for that. Willingness to work with others, the idea of, of collaboration is important. And finally, willingness to accept adequacy in multiple disciplines over specialization in one. He mentions a couple, uh, a few other more focused interdisciplinary skills, communicating effectively in disciplines, oral and written, probably, abstract thinking, dialectic thinking, the ability to take two opposing ideas and merge them and synthesize them into a new idea, uh, dialectic thinking, uh, and I'm sorry, and nonlinear thinking, seeing it from different perspectives, thinking creatively, and thinking holistically, seeing the bigger picture. So these are some skills that we, we think we can incorporate into our new definition of the polymath. So in the end, our polymath um, seeks to obtain a skill set that is universally relevant in a variety of disciplines, vocations, and endeavors. And you all know that people change careers a lot these days. But the skill set can be used in a variety of academic or, uh, work settings. Um, our polymath may not make significant discoveries or contributions in a field, but they will have the skill set that allows them to, to do a lot of things, to evaluate, to analyze, to apply, to create, um, to, to formulate effective questions as a starting point, to integrate fields of knowledge, to consider and analyze bodies of knowledge, to use appropriate technologies and information systems for accessing knowledge, to synthesize ideas and information, to use critical thinking skills in arriving at potential answers, and finally to apply knowledge. This sounds alarmingly similar to what we seek to do at this institution. Do you all feel like polymaths? <laughs> Um, so, looking after, after those perspectives, let's take a look at where we can find these principles or these people in contemporary society. All right, so one of the challenges in locating the polymath is that we're not looking at the polymath in the traditional sense, in the sense that maybe we'd be looking at with, um, for example, da Vinci or Pythagoras. So if we understand that urbanization and the, and the bureaucratic model of society, of modern society, is antithetical to the polymath because it emphasizes diversity and, uh, excuse, me, excuse me, specialization um, and division of labor, we need to look elsewhere. And we still find some of these elements in more rural areas in the United States. So I grew up in a very, very rural area in northeastern Montana and northwestern North Dakota. Um, my experiences growing up um, had a, a striking resemblance to some of the features of pre-industrial um, era types of living. So, for example, everyone in my area growing up farmed for the most part. Um, my father farmed his entire life, and just like the uh, just like the other farmers in the area, he had to have a very large breadth of knowledge. So he had to know a little bit about plant science to grow wheat. He had to know a little bit about veterinary science. Um, he did his own vaccinations. He would um, deliver calves pretty much every spring. He had to have mechanical skills. Not to mention the fact he had to cultivate social, uh, community, and political skills as an active member of the Farmers Union, and not to mention he had to have a basic understanding of finance and banking to run a business. Also in rural areas, we find rural educators that have a large breadth of knowledge. Um, I graduated in a high school class of five. Um, Chris, <laughs> Shelley, Lacey, Corey, and Chase, and uh, still know what they're all doing. Um, but the thing is, I, we only had 30, 30 students in our high school. so. Our, uh, our teachers would often have to double up. We didn't have the money to hire a teacher for every discipline. So, um, for example, Mr. West was our track coach, our history teacher, and our business teacher. Um, Mr. Smith taught English, psychology, and physical education. 
Miss Neuwirth taught math and biology, and Mr. Ulrichson taught music and driver's education. And this is the way that we survived, um, was by having this breadth of knowledge. One other example, I'll give you one more example. So I was born in Plentywood, Montana, 1978, in the 70s, that old. So back then it was Dr. Kirk. We had two doctors at our hospital, Dr. Kirk and Dr. Kirk's son, Dr. Kirk. <laughs> and between the Dr. Kirks, they delivered all six of us, six of the Garneaus. Um, but it wasn't just that. Um, Dr. Kirk, don't remember which one, but one of them set my brother's arm uh, when he broke it. They treated me for asthma. They treated my grandmother for diabetes. Um, they had to be fairly skilled in a wide range of areas of medicine just to survive. Um, so on an everyday basis, he may treat people for things from um, high blood pressure to sleep apnea to hyperactivity, uh, depending on the day. This is the general practitioner, something that we don't see nearly as much in cities, something that we wouldn't have a, a, as much contact with. So to bring this back around full circle to academia and how this relates to the polymath, when we look at localized institutions, we look at institutions that still operate at a local and a community level, we see remnants of this. Um, we see this in elite boarding schools, uh, the Choate School in Connecticut and the Madeira School in Washington, D.C., where students are encouraged to learn philosophy, um, where they're encouraged to learn uh, foreign language and to have a very uh, large breadth. These are, by the way, the most elite schools you can go to. The other area that we find this is in liberal arts education. And what's really, really important about what we're doing is that we're contributing to this idea of the polymath. Even if we can't locate an example of a modern polymath the way that we could before, we can still find the essence of it in these institutions, these fairly low bureaucratic, community-based institutions where we still operate in the way that they did. So to bring this all home, in spite of the bureaucratic process, which is endemic to academia, as educators and students in a liberal arts um, institution, we are unique in the ability to locate the spirit of the polymath. Thanks. <laughs>